Hey everybody, before we get started, just wanted to make a quick note for those doing some holiday shopping. Faith Matters just released its latest book, Better Than Happy by Jody Moore, which is available right now. We also wanted to remind you about our two other books, All Things New by Fiona and Terrell Givens and Restoration by Patrick Mason, both of which we think would make excellent holiday gifts. If you're a new listener, you can hear about those books in episodes 57 and 59, respectively. And of course, we'd also recommend Thomas McConkie's course, Transformations of Faith, which you can find out more about by listening to episode 55. To find where to purchase any of these, just head to faithmatters.org and click on the Books and Courses link in the main navigation menu. Thanks, and we'll get right into the episode. Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. For this episode, we got to speak with Dan Vallone, who's the U.S. Director of a nonprofit foundation called More in Common. Their mission is to build a more united and inclusive America that is resilient to the profound threats posed by our country's polarization. Dan has a super impressive background, including serving six years active duty as a U.S. Army infantry officer with one tour in Afghanistan. Dan is a graduate of West Point and earned a master's degree from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore on a Fulbright scholarship, and later an MBA from Harvard Business School. He also spent time as a special advisor on innovation to the U.S. Department of Education. In this conversation, Dan spent time helping us to understand why it is that it seems we've become so divided politically in the United States, and he shared some really interesting research that shows that the large majority of Americans are proponents of listening and compromise and good faith engagement with those on the other side of the aisle. He also shared a lot of really practical takeaways about how we can be active healers in our communities and how faith institutions like the church can play vital roles in helping us to come together. We want to extend a huge thanks to Dan for his thoughtfulness and leadership on this issue. And of course, a big thanks to each one of you who take time to listen. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And with that, we'll jump right in. Okay, Dan Vallone, thank you so much for for joining us on the podcast today. It's great to be here. Excited. Yeah, we are too. This is this is a conversation that we've actually, <clears throat> I mentioned to, uh, this to you earlier, but something we've wanted to talk about for uh, quite some time, but felt like we never uh, quite were able to find the right uh, the right representative to talk about it and feel like we've really found that in you. So we're we're super grateful, super excited to have this have this conversation. Um, our listeners will have just heard that you um, are the the U.S. and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the U.S. director of of an organization, a nonprofit called More in Common that um, that actively uh, uh, tries, I don't want to use the word fights against because that's sort of combative, but <laughs> that, that actively seeks to um, heal the divide in our in our country, the, at least the U, in, uh, in your US um, arm of this organization. Um, so maybe we could start out, could you talk a little bit about the organization itself, why, why it exists, how it came to be, and, and how you got involved? Sure, happy to, and again, appreciate the chance, uh, Tim and Aubrey, to talk with you today about polarization, uh, particularly in the US context. So. More in Common is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit. Uh, we work alongside of other More in Common teams in, the Fra- in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And as you mentioned, we conduct public opinion studies on polarization. What are the forces that are driving Americans apart? Where are there opportunities to bring people together? And how do we actually do that on the ground, uh, digitally, online, and offline as well? And More in Common does that in Western Europe as well as the US. And More in Common is a relatively new organization. So we stood up in the US in 2018 and in 2017 and in Europe. And the reason More in Common launched was to address the kind of uh, startling and I think even frightening acceleration of polarization in the US and across Western Europe. We really saw that there were uh, extreme movements that seemed to be dividing these countries, turning neighbor against neighbor and increasingly ratcheting up uh, angry and often violent rhetoric and actions. And so more in common was stood up to try and address this, to try and bring really good and strong research to the table to say, here's what we know about what's actually driving people apart. Here's where we still can find common ground. And here's how we mobilize and engage across some of these lines of difference to reduce the level of polarization and help our society start solving problems again more constructively and productively. That's awesome. I, I, I want to dive in on just a comment that you made. Uh, you, you said that polarization has been accelerating. And I think a lot of people uh, maybe around, I mean, you know, potentially my age have felt like, you know, this is, this is the, it, the most polar, polarized we've ever been. But I obviously, <clears throat> and uh, other, you know, young people don't have the, the context of history that to benefit from. Is there research that actually says that we are more, more polarized than, than we've ever been? Yes. So unfortunately, and I, I want to be specific here. So if we look at 
politics or political ideology, yes, we are more polarized now than really we have been, let's say, in the last 50 to 60 years. So there was a 2015 paper that looked at Congress, and they measured the degree to which members of Congress crossed over the aisle and voted alongside of the other side. So Democrats voting with Republicans, Republicans voting with Democrats. And there's a very powerful visualization of this on YouTube. And basically what you can see is that for most of Congress's history over the past 60 years, it was somewhat common for Democrats to vote with Republicans, Republicans to vote with um, Democrats. And you can just watch over time as we start to hit the 2000s in particular, it becomes increasingly less common. And now when you look at Congress today, basically no one crosses the aisle. It is extraordinarily rare for anybody to vote alongside of the other party. And so it makes things like the, when people vote on the Infrastructure Act, for example, this year, I mean, again, it wasn't a massive amount of bipartisan action, but it, it was notable because it, had been, it has been so rare for anybody to vote uh, across the aisle. So that's one way to measure it. That paper was published in 2015. And then at the kind of public opinion level, we are also the most politically polarized we, we have ever been in the last, again, in the last 60 years. I mean, if we extended the timeline, there are uh, pre-Civil War, et cetera, there would be periods in our time when we were probably just as polarized. Uh, but when you look at public opinion, we are also the most politically polarized we have ever been. And by that, we, we measure it by saying the degree to which, for example, Democrats have a very negative view of Republicans and Republicans have a very negative view of Democrats. The degree to which you view the, your partisan opponents no longer as just political opponents, but oftentimes as a threat. And that uh, level is at the highest it has been in recent history. Wow. So is that, I mean, is that the main difference? Like, it, it feels like there's this really problematic polarization that we're talking about, but then I wonder like, you know, what is the difference between that and just like the really inevitable and natural sorting that's gonna happen in any group where you have a variety of lived experiences and opinions. And, you know, like, is this just a clarity of positions and that's like what we're seeing or, or what, like what makes it polarization? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And, and it, when we think about polarization, we do want to be specific. And so polarization, in if we just think of polarization as people having differing views, the degree of difference between two people on any issue, it's not a bad thing inherently, right? Polarization is probably a good thing. You want many competing views. You want people to have differences in their opinion and perspectives and, and feel able to express those opinions. So polarization by itself, even extreme polarization we've seen in other countries not lead to any kind of anti-democratic or violent behavior. So polarization by itself is, is manageable and a certain degree of polarization is probably healthy. What we see in the US is what we call affective polarization. So it is the degree to which I, it's not just that I have a different opinion from you, it is I start to see you as a threat. I actively start to associate you as being a threat to me to, and my in-group. So if I'm a Republican, affective polarization means that I increasingly see Democrats as a threat to my well-being, my family's well-being, and my political group's well-being. And the same is true for Democrats. Affective polarization is very dangerous because what we start to see is it causes us to justify our own side breaking norms and in some instances breaking laws because we see the other side to be so threatening. So that's where we shift from clarifying and having a diversity of viewpoints being expressed to actively being almost uh, tribal in our behavior right. and approaches to politics. And that's very, very um, dangerous. So, well, so oh, is it possible, is it possible to have you know, deep, deep conviction without that kind of, what did you call it? Affective, affective polarization? polarization. Like, it, yes. yeah, like if, it, I mean, if on, on issues that feel moral to people that feel like there should be no compromise because this is a, a moral issue. And like, I want to be on the right side of history. And so I, there, it, I can't compromise. Like, is it possible to feel that strongly about something without creating this, this really damaging dynamic? It absolutely is. And, and it, there have been times in the US and certainly we can look in other countries where that happens, where people have very strong issues where they, they feel moral, where this is not a political issue for someone, it is a moral conviction, but what they don't see the other side as being a threat. And part of the okay. challenge in the yeah. US is that increasingly what we have seen happen is that among people who identify as Democrats or Republicans, they increasingly endorse all of their party's views. So again, if we moved back 30 years, it wasn't 
uncommon to have a Democrat who also held certain positions that we might associate with Republicans today. Like that kind, or we had a Republican who had position, who held positions that we associate with Democrats today. It was very, it was much more common for folks to have kind of a diversity of views within a political party. And so that meant that if I'm a Republican, I don't necessarily see Democrats as this kind of monolithic threatening entity. I can see nuance and diversity in views. And so even though I might very much disagree with a Democrat on a position on uh, guns, for example, I don't think of them as a threat because I know, I know that there are other Democrats who have the same position on guns that I do. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so you, so you may just, the, the specific position that is opposite yours might feel threatening. You know, if you're an immigrant, yeah that the opposite position or the, the position that you are not welcome in America, that feels, that may feel threatening, but you're not, you're not, the difference is you're saying that the entire party feels like a threat, that just the yes. fact that someone is associated with a certain party makes them a threat altogether. Right. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. So if you went in a case That's when both parties had like a diversity of views on immigration, right, somebody who felt that immigration, welcoming immig immigrants was a moral position, wouldn't feel the same sense of threat because they knew that there are people on both sides of the aisle who might have a welcoming orientation towards immigrants, for example. Right, okay, that makes we, so much sense, yeah. Yeah, could we uh, talk a little bit about how we how we got here? I'm curious, I was just reading a um, an article by Jonathan Haidt in The Atlantic mm -hmm. that says, and this is just unrelated, but um, says that in, in social science, it sounds like it's very uncommon to see elbows in studies. For example, there's a, a huge uptick, you know, in the 2013 to 2015 type time, rate, uh, time frame of, adolescent girls that suffer from anxiety and depression, which normally you see trends and they sort of, you know, they sort of move along, slowly move, going up or down. But in this case, in like, again, in Jonathan Hyde's article, you do see this huge uptake all of a sudden. Is that, is that something that we've, that, that we've seen in, in polarization too? Or, is, or has this been happening, you know, steadily over the, uh, over the past 50, 60 years? Or, or have there been some sort of accelerants that have like really caused a, a change? Yeah, I think the answer is both. And I, I don't want to dodge it I, because I think that it is true that there are accelerants that we have seen in the last five, 10 years, but the underlying drivers have unfolded on a much longer time horizon. And so when more in common thinks about polarization, we, we think about this, uh, we, try, we try and step into an individual's perspective. And what we think about are there have been these massive macro changes. So if you think about the last 30 years, you've had uh, kind of seismic economic changes in terms of the transformation of jobs, whether it's remote work, whether it's just online work. So we've had China coming into the WTO and in terms of just a lot of transformation in terms of what kinds of jobs are available, who has access to what jobs, what is the stability and future prospects of jobs. So massive economic transformation. We've had climate change and the association, associated increase in the movement of people, right? So like people are moving across the globe in a much more accelerated because certain areas are no, are no longer hospital. And that's a trend that's unlikely to change in the, in the near term. Uh, we've also had media fracturing, and this is most acute in the US. It's not quite as bad in the Europe, European countries we work in, but you've seen that whereas in the 1980s, we had a fairness doctrine. We also had three major cable broadcasters. Now we have a massive ecosystem of media, but in the US, it is also kind of fractured. So you have very clear liberal media outlets, you have very conservative outlets, and there's you know, increasingly less overlap. So all of that is happening. You have aging demographics so in the US, baby boomers are aging combined with, um, a, again, migration of people from many different countries coming into the, a variety of locations. So those are all kind of happening. And at the same time in the US, we have had social media, right? And so all of a sudden this, there is a network effect that it, we've seen happen where it accelerates all of these trends and it allows for these political mega identities to become so much more present in our lives. Like if you're, if you're politically engaged in the US, your consumption of political content has just like spiked unbelievably mm -hmm. high. So it is increasingly common to just see a political picture of the US. And that is one that is divided into two camps with a very, and it depends on if you're consuming liberal content, like you're gonna see a very unfavorable picture of Republicans and vice the inverse is true. And so that's what I mean. Like I think there are these large changes that have been happening and certainly drive polarization. There's other things like we've sorted ourselves as a country where there's just increasingly less social contact between liberals and conservatives. But 
the accelerant comes with like things like media and social media, where it just becomes much more present in our lives. And then you have political entrepreneurs that in the 20 kind of like mid 2010s, you started to see take advantage of this and actively recognize that oh, polarization can be a political tool to advance uh, their objectives. And they very effectively kind of harnessed it to further divide the country and achieve political goals. Wow. We really loved this, um, this report from 2018 from More in Common called um, Hidden Tribes. And you, they talk about this idea of, of the loss of identity and belonging having kind of being the foundation of, of this whole problem. And, and it talks about how, um, how that loss of identity is being exploited and, and kind of makes you vulnerable to this us versus them mentality. So are these the changes that, that you think caused the loss of identity or belonging? Or like, what, how, like where, did the, where did the vulnerability even come from? Like, why suddenly are we are we, why, why suddenly do we all lose our identity and, and like start looking for that in, in politics? Yeah, when one thing, and I think Jonathan Haidt also talks about this in, in some of his writings, but a number of psychologists have written about this, which is when people feel a, a heightened sense of threat and that threat can come from a variety of sources. We as humans kind of retrench into the identities that give us the greatest sense of security, right? We want safety and security and we want attachment to groups. That's Linda Tropp also writes a lot about this in research, very powerful psychological and sociological driver in humans. So I think all of those macro changes, and we also, you know, we could continue to add to the list, but have caused a number of millions, millions of Americans, millions of people across the globe to feel a heightened sense of threat. And when you feel that it is also it creates a lot more vulnerabilities to see out groups, people who are different from you mm. in, ideologically, demographically, geographically as threats. And so that's what we've seen is some of these kind of dehumanizing narratives and, and that have emerged are, are capitalizing on this sense of threat. But that sense of threat is made worse by this lack of sense of belonging, right? So, and we can look to things like the erosion of civil society. And so a lot of the institutions that used to bring people together have changed. Like this is Robert Putnam talking about bowling alone. That's you kind of saying that you've seen the erosion of a lot of those things. There's also really interesting research that suggests it's not so much that they have disappeared as they have migrated towards political movements. So if you think about, and this is, it's kind of brought to, um, a good illustration of this is that the New York Times has more subscribers in Dallas than the Dallas Morning News does, right? So we have seen that over the last 20 years, kind of national political movements, national entities have increasingly been where people find their strongest sense of belonging, their strongest like social endeavor. And that just causes people to have a very different sense of belonging than a local institution which might have brought people together across lines of race, class, or faith. Um, so that I think is really also a, a key challenge that we face in the U.S. is how do you create social fabric across lines of difference? Yeah, yeah. that makes a ton of sense. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, another thing that the, um, the Hidden Tribes report brought up was that a lot of us feel like we're trapped in this completely polarized society. You know, it's 50% on this poll, 50% on this poll. Um, but what, what it shared was that that's actually not, that's actually not the case. And potentially within, within sort of the, the general populace, at least, there might be a lot of, um, a lot of willingness to listen and, and, and compromise. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that research? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what the Hidden Tribes report is based on is in 2018, Warren Common conducted an 8,000 person national survey, so like very large national poll. And we used a statistical process called cluster analysis to identify seven distinct segments of Americans. And it's important to understand the report that when we created those segments, we didn't use any kind of demographic or political variables. So we didn't use race or gender or geography or that, whether somebody was a Republican or Democrat. The factors that went into segmenting people were their responses to questions that asked about their underlying core beliefs. So how do they how do they feel about morality? How do they feel about what's right and wrong? Where do they parenting approaches? Uh, we drew on a lot of social psychology li literature, Jonathan Haidt included, uh, Karen Stenner, and some of her work around authoritarianism in terms of how do we better understand the frameworks through which people make decisions about what is right and what is good and what is bad. And then we also asked about their level of engagement with things like reading news, taking part in community activities. And so 
with that as the input variables, we identified these seven distinct uh, segments of Americans. And the kind of key way we divide them is we think of there's three segments that are hi highly politically polarized, right? So they are, they, their political identity is their most important identity. It is what motivates them. It is how we can understand them. But for the other four segments, which constitute a majority of Americans, their political identity isn't their most important identity. Their family identity is their most important identity, their community identity. And for some, uh, they don't feel a very strong identity, right? There's segments of the population that feel very disengaged uh, from all kinds of community. And so with that kind of picture breaks down that 50-50 myth that we think the country is and shows that we have a diversity of views on any number of issues and the intensity with which we feel towards any particular view also varies dramatically, right? So like most people don't feel that strongly about most political issues, but a small subset of the population feel incredibly intensely about most political issues. Well, I love the, the term that comes up. You, um, it's called the exhausted majority. And I thought it was so interesting because I, I think there's this idea that you know, if you don't have strong opinions and if you're not lining up with your party, then you kind of, you're like lacking integrity or you're, you're not engaged. And like, there's something to be um, like, there, there's like shame there. You know, you, yeah. if you had integrity, you would like check every box in your, with whatever your party's saying. And so I, I thought this was so interesting that the majority of Americans are very nuanced and, and may, maybe, maybe not because they don't care, but because they just, it just doesn't line up perfectly with with either party. And so they may pull like their moderates or, you know, some kind of like centrist, but really they just, they, there's a lot more ambiguity than what you might think if you're just, you know, in your own Facebook echo chamber or, or listening to whatever news source is going to speak to your political affiliation. So could you talk about how the exhausted majority could play a part in, in sort of de polarizing our whole nation? Sure, absolutely, and it's it's very true. And, and you know, one of the things that Jonathan Haidt writes writes about in his Moral Foundations work, which we drew on for Hidden Tribes and continue to draw on, is one of the Moral Foundations is purity. And some Americans feel very feel this Moral Foundation very strongly, and you can see it play out in politics, where you do see the enforcement of purity checks on one's own political side. And it's you know, again, like if you go into like social literature on that, it's a very, getting disassociated from your group is a traumatizing event. So humans will go take enormous act, uh, lengths to stay a part of their group. It's very, very disorienting and harmful if we feel like cast out. So the purity factor is very powerful in politics right now. And it primarily enforces, I think, negative kind of dynamics, which is why the exhausted majority are so interesting because they're not centrist. They're not even, some of the, some of them are moderate. Some of them are very much like, you know what, we, we should just compromise and move forward. Many members of the exhaust majority hold inconsistent views. So that's where they have some views that are Democrat, some views that are Republican. And it makes them interesting because they don't feel that sense of uh, purity that needs to be enforced. They're willing to be like, well, on this issue, we should do this and we should, we should feel, uh, you know, we should work together to collaborate on it. And they're also just very desiring a different kind of politics, right? So for a lot of the most politically engaged Americans, there is this real sense of what we, what we kind of refer to as like win or die. And if that's, you know, again, others have talked about that dynamic as being very pervasive, but it's like, if we don't win this election, things are over. And the exhaustion majority don't feel that way. And, I, and <clears throat> again, they're not, they're not moderates or centrists in kind of a soft way. But I think that they can play a positive role because they are the majority, right? So I think one of the things that we consistently try and underscore is if you are feeling exhausted and fed up with the way that our politics and sense of division has just so um, overtaken so much in our society, one, you're very justified in feeling that. Two, you're, you're certainly not alone. In fact, your views, you, your, your viewpoint probably is much more common than you think. And three, there are actions that you can take. You know, the, the answer isn't necessarily for the exhausted majority to become more politically engaged, there's lots of ways that they can start to recreate or try and focus on that social fabric, which might then dissipate some of our vulnerabilities when it comes to polar, extreme polarization or affective polarization. So could yeah. you talk about some of those specific steps that, that they can take? Yeah, sure. And it's, um, <clears throat> there's a, a variety of actions that, that they can take. And I think one is creating community, well, one, this kind of podcast is one thing I would say, right? So like, 
do you have a, a media outlet or a local organization that actively brings together a diversity of viewpoints within a common framework of we're going to recognize that we have a lot in common, we disagree on a lot, and we need to maintain our relationships and figure out ways to peaceably manage our differences and work on all the things we have in common. I think one of the things that we have found most striking is the need to kind of penetrate this myth that the only issues facing our country are these hyper-nationalized issues, right? There's any number of things happening on the ground in communities that there's a ton of local support or there's much less disagreement <laughs> around, whether that is things addressing housing or water or the opioid crisis. Like there's lots of where, areas where there's more room to kind of work across political lines of difference at the local level. It is just hard because the political institutions we have have become hyper-nationalized. So one thing we stress for the exhaustive majority is find ways to become engaged at, on non-national local issues within your local community. Second is diversify your media consumption. Like think about, is, am I just continuously seeing the same voices, the same messages when I read, when I listen? Like step away from that and try and find just different sources. It doesn't mean if you're a Democrat, you need to go find the most conservative media, consume that. Just get out of your echo chamber and help that inform your, your views. And I think the third is, you know, to the extent that you can, encourage your political, encourage your side. Like if you are, if you have a political identity, you can be what we call an in-group moderate, which is standing up within your own, own political kind of camp and saying like, look, we should have a more nuanced and humane approach in our politics. And again, that's best at the local level. And there's a lot of need for in-group moderates who again, probably constitute the majority to find their collective voice in organizing our political behavior. That makes a ton of sense. I, you're, you're making me think about where I actually, you know, get out into the community and engage with people who, who disagree with me on any number of issues. I think, you know, potentially for me, one of the places where I actually do that is, is at church. Um, what, the way the Latter-day Saint tradition does this is that we're organized into congregations by, by geography. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't, I'm not sure what the tr term is, but we don't church shop, you know, and see where, <laughs> you know, where like our favorite pastor is or whatever, where, you know, our favorite congregation is people that think like us. And so that does sort of force you into, uh, even though obviously in given neighborhoods, cities, uh, et cetera, there uh, obviously demographic factors can lead to, you know, people being similar, but it does, it does force you to some extent into a place, uh, a place where you're not going to agree with everybody on, on everything. Um, and I think that's really healthy, but at the same time, I think generally, and I think this is probably an American or maybe even a worldwide just societal phenomenon, we're not very good at having conversations where we, where we disagree with people. And I, I find that sometimes, you know, sometimes I see it lived really healthily at, at church or, you know, in other, uh, in other settings, but often I think out of a desire to, you know, treat each other well, we avoid the conversation entirely just because, yeah, uh, we don't want to get into, you know, a quote unquote awkward, you know, situation or, you know, we don't want to, you know, have to engage in a, in a difficult way with somebody and then, you know, go home and live next to them, you know? And so like, I, I'm curious if you guys have done any work on this or if you have personal thoughts on how to, how to engage healthily in conversations um, where we, where we disagree. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Definitely what we, what we hear, hear and see all the time. So a, a few things, a partner of ours called Open Mind Platform, which also is uh, anchored in Jonathan Haidt's research, just released. So they do curriculum actually on like viewpoint diversity. So they just released a an experiential toolkit you can walk through about how do you have uh, how do you manage Thanksgiving conversations with people who have very oh, yeah, different, different good, political yeah, views. Well. So Open Mind Platform, I would strongly recommend it. They kind of walk you through like, okay, <laughs> you know, here's what's happening as when you encounter somebody with a different viewpoint, like literally physiologically, we start to, you know, we tense up, we start mm -hmm. to get flushed. It's like not a, not a fun experience, but if you are aware of that, you can be mindful and you can, there are actually a lot of uh, best practices that you can do to get over some of those impediments. And then what we also consistently find is that at the end of it, people tend to feel better when they've talked to people who have different viewpoints and it hasn't devolved into a fight they actually feel really good. There's like a cathartic effect that can happen. So I do stress that there are ways you can have good conversations. But stepping back, I think 
we have a little bit of a, of a funny situation where we need a lot more spaces that are less political and where people can come together to just do things, solve problems and work with people who are different, but not necessarily talk about those differences in that setting, right? So we need mm. PTAs or another example where like we, we need healthy PTAs that bring together a diversity of backgrounds around their common identity as parents and school community members. It doesn't mean that we need PTAs to be hyper-political and talking about political issues, but it'd be great if people who had ideological differences also were able to collaborate on helping the kids in their schools you know, improve their education, et cetera. But we also need to introduce politics in a couple of spaces where the settings are better conditioned to have healthy conversations. And that I think this is one area where faith institutions can actually play a really powerful role, negatively or positively. I think for a variety of reasons, faith identities are ones that have a lot of power and importance in many people's lives. There are spaces where we are, where people are actively in a mindset of values and morality and trying to think about what's right and what's wrong. And it can be very tempting to either avoid politics entirely because we see it as divisive or lean very hard into it, right? You see uh, faith and entities being mobilized in political campaigns. And I think that faith entities can, there's a really healthy place where they can play a midpoint role, right? Where you kind of come together under a common faith identity, but across ideological lines of difference, you acknowledge those differences. You set an explicit goal of, we need to sustain and grow our relationship as, whether that is members of the LDS faith, now that's Mormons, Jews, I'm sorry, um, you know, Muslims, Jews, Christians, across faith. But you set an explicit goal, like we need to build and nurture this common community and we need to be able to recognize that we have differences of opinion and we can't let that just like take us apart. And you, by having that explicit goal kind of studies show that you can actually constructively set up a process within faith institutions to talk to each other about issues that are divisive, to work together on issues that you actually identify you have in common, right? And then to be able to elevate that personal relationship, which serves as a buffer when politics gets introduced outside of the faith setting. Yeah. yeah. So is it possible that it's um, just harder to completely demonize someone when you when you know them on a on a personal level? You know, if you've done something side by side with them that was that was constructive, it's harder to then find out, oh, they're a Democrat, oh, they're a Republican, or whatever, and say, and see them as the enemy because you know they're you already know they're not the enemy. You know, they don't you know based on your personal interact interactions with them that they don't have it out for you and and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of, it helps you. I mean, I think this is, this is what I certainly found in, in my life because of the, I was in the army. And so I kind of lived all across, we, you know, we lived all across the country. Our social networks are ideologically diverse. The caricatures of political parties has just never really resonated with us because we know people who voted, uh, you know, who voted for Trump and who do any number of things which are amazingly compassionate and would, you know, kind of, uh, not comport with what we think of as like the Trump voter stereotype. We also know people who voted for everybody on the left, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, et cetera. And they don't fit these caricatures that get presented in, uh, in a variety of settings. So by having these personal relationships with people who have different viewpoints, you can also reduce the degree to which you tend to exaggerate the other side's level of extremity. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. I would ahead, love to hear more just about, I mean, I do feel like this is, this is the majority that like what you're describing feels like, you know, the people I know personally, that, that seems to be more accurate to, um, to describe like their political leanings. Like they, they, they feel tired and every, and every, and they're exhausted by the, by the biggest voices. And so I just wonder if you could talk about why and, or how we keep electing people who do not represent that like is it is it that the exhausted majority is not engaging and so they're like we're just not seeing those votes or or i mean i just feel like if you're only looking at candidates and and election results you wouldn't guess that there were so many people who were feeling this way no not at all uh, there's an enormous gap between and this is we there's pieces of this that we've known for a long time, like polling has always, 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 always shown enormous common ground on things like gun control, immigration, or any number of issues. We kind of always seen like 55% oh, of Americans feel this way. So why does, why is it impossible to see anything happen? I, I think there are a couple of factors. One is there are systems which govern how we elect people, which 
kind of give power to the hyper activist elements in political mm-hmm. movements, right? So most, I think the number, I forget what the percentage is, but it's probably north of 75% of congressional districts are more or less one party districts. Like they're not very competitive. So the real competitive race in that district is the party primary. Right. And so as a result, right, whoever gets their base out in the primary is odds on gonna win. So that's one way in which we kind of see an undue influence of a minority of viewpoints uh, being exercised and who gets elected. There's things like gerrymandering, all that kinds of this, the systems effect is is certainly true. I, but I think even, even if we correct for those systems, because our colleagues in Europe, for example, don't have presidential systems, they don't have these kind of party uh, primary systems, and we still see a disconnect between elected officials and what... Hmm you know, the broad majority wants in any country, there are two things. One, like level of political engagement is less, you know, if you're, if you are, the more intensely you feel about politics, the more likely you're going to vote in every election, right? So your voice gets disproportionately influenced. But the second is, I do feel like this is particularly true in the U.S., um, the degree to which elected officials can fundraise off of national brands so they don't like the degree to which they are reliant on local actors local funders has just weakened enormously where somebody can build an online presence and be fueled by donations from people from across the country entirely based upon their national brand and it, we see this playing out in lots of ways which i think is is very uh divisive and worsens this sense of polarization because again, you're just not as much rooted in the needs of any particular district where if you dove into the district, you'd find a lot of people who wanted you to actually compromise and take action. Right, that makes so much sense. I, I wonder how else, I mean, how else are you seeing that social media is is contributing? I mean, that, I, just fundraising by itself, I think that's, that's an interesting dimension, but how else do you think generally social media is affecting the way we, we feel about our political party? Yeah. I think the role of social media is so interesting, so important, and, and, and a little hard to understand, to be honest. So uh, the Aspen Institute, for example, just published, I think they called it the Commission on Our Information Disorder. And they had, you know, they take social media to task, talk about, you know, the algorithmic issues that incentivize toxic content, right? So mm-hmm. and there's any number of studies which show, for example, on COVID misinformation, it's like 12 people that produce. Ninety wow. percent content, but then it gets pumped through this right. this universe of users. So, I think one thing that social media has done, and its algorithms kind of do, is distort people's view of facts in a very broad based way. Like I, I don't want to say it is entirely like Facebook and Twitter and and TikTok's fault, right? Because most online ads don't get clicked. Like there's a lot of things that don't seem to actually register with people but they have created these atmospheres where it's very difficult to see or tell what is fact, what is opinion, what is false. So they've reduced our society's ability to align on a a consistent shared understanding of fact. And that makes everything harder and everything from a polarization standpoint worse. I think the the two other things that social media has done that worsens our political ability to work together in politics. One is you've seen uh, a, a network form between mainstream media and social media among political reporters. So again, it, like it, we have these echo chambers and now it extends from social media into the mainstream news who are reporting on what they see on Twitter or Facebook. When we know that people who are active on social media in politics are disproportionately representative of the extreme, what we call them wings in our segmentation, but their voices get echoed in mainstream news, which then gets fed into everybody's lives. So if, even if you're just watching ABC news, if they do a, a, a segment that touches on, here's what we saw on Twitter, you're getting fed a distorted picture. And so I think that really has eroded our ability. Again, it has distorted our picture of our own side and of the other side in ways that make it much more difficult um, to work yeah. together. And I think the the last thing that I would just kind of note is it's, and it's, again, this is where it's complex to assign like motive to social, social media, but you definitely see people are much more willing to be aggressive and hostile on social media, right? There is a degree to which we disassociate our 
norms and behaviors when we are engaging in online online and that's just where when when that's where so much of our encounters with people who are different happens that sets our kind of expectations for the other side or for people who have a different viewpoint yeah, right. yeah. i was just so i was fun. just gonna ask about this i mean the most i think the most toxic conversations that i've witnessed for the most part they take place they take place online mm -hmm. and it, it seems like a very rare exception where you have a healthy disagreement take place in in you know facebook comment sections do you is, have you guys looked into this at all is there is there some kind of model you know or template that people listening could could start to follow to engage and i mean i you know and i i'm fully compl complicit as much as anybody else with this but like you know to to start to engage healthily um with those with with whom we disagree online because I, I think like what you're saying it's I think it's probably embedded deeply psychologically biologically within us that when we're interacting with characters on a screen we don't assign the same humanity to the other side that we do when we're when we're with someone in person so how do we how do we escape that that trap you know and get into these in, into healthier discussions when we're when we're online yeah it's I mean it's super hard in some ways there's like some very low-hanging fruit but that probably won't happen but it's things like if you got rid of the retweet button because a lot of content is just you know yeah. <laughs> retweeted and it's not actually like a conversation so yeah that's true. things that reduce yeah. our impulsive behavior and cause us to move into like um uh I'm, I'm th in thinking fast thinking slow you know there's a type of fast thinking and slow thinking you want to activate the slow thinking not the fast thinking so what we have done and what others have done as well, is there are good examples, right? So there, there was a, a good story, I think it was in the Washington Post maybe six months ago. It was about a Reddit thread and it was a thread that had seemed proven to be very effective at debunking COVID-19 misinformation. And the way they did it, one, I mean, one, it was hyper moderated. It's like a very active moderator who enforced a set of norms. And one of those norms was anything that you share, you have to back up with evidence. And by evidence, we mean mm. like, what study are you pointing to? Show us where in the study the data conforms with what you said. So that this community had organized around a very high bar when it comes to evidence that was consistently enforced. But the third thing they did that was interesting was they didn't shame people for not knowing. They were said like, look, this is complex. We welcome a variety of viewpoints. We want people to come in with, you know, challenging. So it was, a, it didn't, they didn't become a place where people who have uncertainty about their views or even a difference in the viewpoint felt judged. Because when you start to feel shamed or judged, it, you're just done. You're not going to have a constructive dialogue. And the other side, if you feel contempt, you're not going to have a constructive dialogue. Contempt and shame are ne have no place in a constructive dialogue. So that's one template. The other thing that so more in common does online research as well, and we've organized communities to try and see can we foster good in group, you know, in uh, cross group dialogue, and it takes time. So we have we have we have been able to do it, but we spend months with these individuals, getting to know them. We introduce them in in group settings where it's just people who have the same viewpoint to just kind of nurture a certain conversation, and then we might start to. Uh, showcase opportunities where they can hear from or see the views of others who they might disagree with, but in a context where we're one, we're moderating, two, we ask and require that you write out sentences. So there's no like just emojis you can tap into, wow. and say, like, write it out. And that forces people to just slow their thinking a little bit. And so that works, it, it is, it's more work, um, but it might be what we kind of as society need to build into the social media of the future and or our own online conversations is just a new set of norms, a new set of behaviors and a new kind of set of parameters for how we engage with each other. One, uh, yeah. one concept that Aubrey and I have talked about a little bit is something that, that we heard termed as, as steel manning, which is a sort of play on, play on the term straw man, uh -huh. um, meaning that when you, see a, when you see an argument that you disagree with, um, you sort of, you restate it, you know, back to the person that made it in the absolutely most charitable way possible. You know, you, you try and really get at the, the core of, of what they're saying in the most generous way and sort of restate it back to them and say, you know, is that, is that what you're saying? And, and if the, if the answer is yes, then you, then you address where you disagree with that argument, as opposed to the, what we see much more commonly online, which is I'm going to reframe what you said in the worst possible way and then attack and, and then attack that. And I've seen I've seen this play out. I, I have a couple of uh, social media, uh, social media friends and acquaintances that actually do this really well. And it's remarkable that those are the only those seem to be the only threads that I uh, where where there seems to be good faith discussion going back and forth. It, I, it feels like and I don't know. I don't I, I wish there were like a 
you know, a great template or framework for this, but it does seem like assuming, you know, assuming the best of your, of the counterparty's argument does seem to be a, a, a key, you know, a, a key in terms of having a healthy back and forth. Completely. And you know, Arthur Brooks also has written about this. He has a book, Love Your Enemies. I mean, he talks a little bit about like, how do you stretch out experiences? So again, you, you can create mindfulness, which I think there's a lot of value to doing that. I, it's also true, and this is what we, when we, when we work with actors who are engaged with politics or civil society, there's a lot of research that suggest if somebody has a different viewpoint from you, you can't persuade them with facts. So like if they come if they just make a statement that you might disagree with, the immediate response is, I wanna correct you. I wanna say, no, it's wrong. Here's the right facts. And if you, don't, now that you know the right facts, you, sh you should agree with me, right? Right, right? Never works, never works. And it, it really hardens the other person's viewpoint because psychologically, like, again, we're just not good. We're not designed to accept facts in like this hyper-rational way. We're emotional, we're, we're committed to our own viewpoints. It, speaks to our level of confidence in who we are. So I react by saying like, no, 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 no. That's just one study that's from a situation that's different. What is shown to change people's mind is like actively listening to them, having them reframe the issue, right? You want to take issues out of this context of where it's like, for you to be, for me to be right, you have to be wrong. Very difficult dynamic to have a constructive conversation. Instead, you kind of want to have individuals reframe issues where they can see either a diversity of rights, like, okay, I can see a couple of things being true here, or they can understand it from a different viewpoint that makes sense to them, right? So it's taking an issue out of politics and situating it within faith and having some like, oh, wait a second. Okay, that's different. I hadn't seen it from that viewpoint. There was a time when X happened to me that might be similar to or analogous to the situation. And they basically persuade themselves. That's a much more effective means of getting people to reframe an issue. And so that's another thing that we often tell people to try and do more of is like, you're better off listening to people, asking them for details, let them build out what it is they're trying to say. And then you're going to see that you have multiple points where you might step in and have a constructive uh, conversation with an individual because you're not going back and forth on who's who's right and who's wrong. I love that, and it it makes sense that that you know communities where you may be more productive persuading each other would be in you know in situations where you're working for common good, like you were saying, like in yeah. you know in churches or your own neighborhood or something where you're you're not even talking about politics, you're just working side by side because then you have this like camaraderie and respect for each other that. And I have felt this too, people who I really disagree with politically, I love and respect because we've served together. And so it re I can feel myself opening up to, there must be something about their position that I don't understand because I respect and love this person. And, and so I don't get it, but like, it must make sense because I know them, you know? And I totally agree. That's so much more persuasive than having a logical argument you know, laid out for me of, that, that would, you know, where the purpose is to convince me to cross sides. So it makes sense that that's a, that's a more productive approach. And, and I'm curious too, if like, you know, is that a way that social media can help heal these divides? Because it, it can also be an opportunity to have these connections that are not necessarily political, but, but that provide opportunities to, you know, share in people's lives and, and like develop some real respect and friendship outside of the political environment. One, thank you for sharing that. Completely agree, and I and I, I think I I often, I often think about there's a number of really great that that's veterans groups out there like Team Rubicon, Mission Continues, who do their service oriented, so they're getting veterans out into the community to do things, and it's such a great one model for how do you help veterans stay engaged. But two, it's, it's it is this place where you build relationships with people who are different from you in the act of service, and that relationship is really such a critical thing in, in reducing polarization. On social media, yes, and I think you know I'm I'm old enough to remember when like social media was new, and it, it, in some instances, you know, 1995, 2005, it feels like actually that's what social media did. It brought people across out of their community. It allowed you to talk to somebody who was from a different geography, different place. Like it really did bridge building in this very interesting way. I feel like things kind of started to change when a lot of the algorithms were introduced to try and maximize engagement, right? And so we just saw a different era of social media when it no longer became about discovery and curiosity, but about, I need you to click on this button so I can get ads to be deployed, which is an oversimplification, but I think like there's a massive shift that happens. And if we could 
build this next era of social media that had a little bit more of that. How do you, how do you foster curiosity? How do you foster, you know, healthy engagement where it's about discovery and listening as much as it is about, and more so than engagement. And I, it, all, it just has always um, struck me that it's what people want too, at the end, like our, there's instinctive reactions that we click on the button, we dislike or we like, and we kind of know it's not good for us. We know that that's not healthy behavior, but it's very hard to break. And it's a, it's a habit that is very powerful. And so we, we do need tools that support humans in accessing that other part of our nature, which is super thoughtful, which is very open to dialogue and conversation. Yeah. yeah. I want to, um, if it's okay, just spend a little bit of time on on a question that's maybe a little bit more tangential to this. And that's, um, that's <clears throat> uh, well, one, to, to preface this, one thing that our listeners probably don't know about you is that you are, you are a veteran, um, went to West Point and spent several years in the, in the U.S. Army as an officer. Um, and I, first of all, thank you, obviously, for, for your service. Um, and I, I, I know, I know have, having known you a little bit, too, that you're, you're very thoughtful and have, have certainly thought about this. Um, the, the, a conversation that we've been having at Faith Matters uh, recently is the role that, that violence has to play mm-hmm. in our society in a, <clears throat> in a, variety, of, a variety of different ways, in, uh, in you know, protests, in policing, in international, international conflict. Um, and I, I don't think there's an, an easy answer to this, but I guess it's really two kind of questions. To what extent, for the first one is, to what extent are we actually seeing an increase in violence due to this political polar, polarization, potentially in the US and, and worldwide? And more generally, given your, given your background, do you, have, do you have thoughts on the role that violence has to play in a, in a civil society? So I'll just let you kind of mm-hmm. take it from there. I appreciate that. I appreciate the framing. And, it, and it's something we, we as an organization and I as an individual, I think a lot about actually. Um, so when it comes to is polarization causing, an in, so there is an increase in violent behavior, at least in the US. Um, and we can look at any number of data sets that indicate that there's just a high uptick in violent activity. Violent activity would mean like, you know, phys- physical altercations, destruction of property, um, et cetera, uh, all the way up to very serious instances of, of, of violence. And I will say it's like the, the data, we want to look at like political violence or violence right. that is not I hate to say like general crime because that is, it's all traumatizing, it's all violence, it all metastasizes into a common uh, <clears throat> picture in some ways. But if we look at like polarization contributing to political violence, I, I would need to go and look at the research because I think I would want to be very, I want to make sure I was right if I said it's causal. Again, there is an uptick in political violence in the US. There, there have been upticks in other countries as well. You saw, we have seen in India, for example, consistently uh, very polarized rhetoric and behavior by, by, on the part of elected officials, at least correlating with upticks in violence against, um, for example, Muslim communities in, in India. So like we, the, we are seeing this happen. Um, in the US, we did a survey right before the 2020 election where we asked about the justification of various behaviors if they're, if, so if, Joe Biden had lost the election and you thought that there had been election fraud, would the following actions be justified? And we asked, we asked that question to Democrats. We asked yeah. the same basic question to Republicans. If Donald Trump loses the election, but you think that there's, there's voter um, irregularities, would the following actions be justified? And we included violence. So we, we did everything from peaceful protests all the way up to physical violence. The good finding was that basically only 4% or less justified violence in that in those situations. 4% is, you know, it should be zero, but that's a very small number. So all that to say is what we, but then when we asked in addition to that, so they say is the appetite for violence in the country is, is very low, right? Although we see it happening and it is increasing, we should also bear in mind that overwhelmingly people want peaceful politics. They want peaceful communities. That is the overwhelming consensus and desire. In the same survey, when we asked people about what they thought the other side would justify, overwhelmingly people thought the other side would justify violence. So oh, wow. even though only 4% of Republicans justified violence, Democrats thought that basically like 50% would. And the same wow. is true of Republicans and Democrats. Yes. So what it, unfortunately where we are at is there is this normalization of violence in the political space 
that is very uh, disturbing. And as like somebody who has spent time in, you know, in Afghanistan in like a society that was ripped apart multiple times through conflict, when you start to normalize violence, you do create more conditions where actors will act on that violence. And so I think a major, uh, we have to do two things as a society, I think, that are really hard to do simultaneously, but are kind of vital right now. One, we need more institutional actors to, to take seriously the risks of political violence in America. So we need businesses, we need faith, we need civil society to recognize that we are uncomfortably um, close to situations where political violence is becoming regularly justified. At the same time, we need more, I mean, we need to know that the picture is not as bad as it we can think it is if we only looked at the most extreme media sources, right? Because once you, if you believe it is so bad, you lose hope. So we need people to know that overwhelmingly Americans reject violence. They want to have peaceful coexistence, even with their political opponents. That is un, un, you know, undeniably the truth. So we need those two things to happen simultaneously. And that's, that's a challenge that we have. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. This has been so incredibly insightful. And is there anything that we missed that before we wrap up that you, you want to cover? I think that, so I would just, if I could come back to um, the question on like, what can faith institutions do, for example? And so we work with a, yeah. a group called One America Movement, which, which works explicitly within faith networks about reducing yeah. polarization, addressing kind of like building, bringing people together across lines of difference. And what they've been working for probably five or six years now. And one of the things that they have done and identified is as institutions, faith, uh, churches, temples, mosques, et cetera, need to have programs to help reduce polarization. That it, although it can happen naturally and organically, it can also become much worse. And so it actually is one of those mm -hmm. things that there is a bit of a template that you can adopt and customize to the specific church or temple or mosque, but it is like a program that is designed to hold people together, nurture relationships and build common acts of service or projects that wow. involve working across lines of difference. So I just wanted to highlight that there are templates out there. There are really good examples. It is, it is hard work, but it is also enormously rewarding work as you know, both of you uh, know from personal yeah, experience. Love that. And let me, let me ask you this too. This is another one that's occurred to me before we, before we sign off here. Um, for those who find themselves in the exhausted majority and who may feel, I mean, and even those who have listened to this podcast and said, okay, well, you know, there are little things I can do here and there, but the real problems are social media. These are trillion dollar companies that we just can't, we can't move the needle. It's government institutions. Uh, it's, bro you know, potentially broken, broken political systems and just are feeling like, you know, they want to, you know, potentially just, just give up. Is there, is there reason for hope? And if so, you know, what is, what is that reason? And please don't say no, there's not, because that'd be a terrible <laughs> note to end the podcast. <laughs> No, 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 there, <laughs> there definitely is. Yeah, there's something I think that we is out there called like dystopian exhaustion. And it's just, I will say we are, <clears throat> there are many challenges facing our country, our society. There's no, no denying that it, it's true. At the same time, what we don't ever see as much coverage is like there's so many things happening that are good and positive, right? Anywhere across the country right now, people are working together to solve a problem, to make something better. <clears throat> we just hosted a convening earlier this year that looked at a nonprofit in Oregon that has held together environmentalists in the logging industry in a county to sustain a timber mill and to help the forest uh, improve its health for a decade. And it's just, they've, they found an effective model, it's happening. We brought together, we brought in an evangelical church that was bringing people together across racial lines to talk about uh, race in, this, in their county, in their church, in their state, and to work together on issues that bucked the trend in 2020 when everything was so polarized. So all kinds of things are happening that are good, that are out there, that are signs that we still have this incredible capacity to work together, even across these very difficult lines of division. And so if you're in the exhaust majority, again, like, totally justified in feeling the way that you are, and I understand that, appreciate that. There's also a lot out there that if you could see, it might give you a lot more hope and optimism that actually that a lot of good things are happening. How can we make it even more common for these kinds of groups to exist and not just look at the you know, large governments or large companies and think like, oh, I can't, I can't beat Facebook. So what can I do? Yeah. Great. Hey. Oh. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, thank amazing. you so much, Dan. <laughs> yeah. We really, really appreciate you coming on. And um, if, if someone is interested in finding out more about your organization, 
um, donating, getting involved. Could you just point them in the right direction? Yeah, sure. The best place to go is more, moreincommon.com is the website. And then if they want to, again, if, if they want more information, contribution, et cetera, they just send an email to us at moreincommon.com. And that's the easiest way to get in touch. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you for everything you. you're doing, Dan. Uh, this is so great. Such thought, again, really appreciate your thoughtful questions and, and conversations. This is one so great to connect, and so happy that you're doing this. And I hope you know, hopefully, there's um, something useful that was said. Absolutely. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Dan Valone. And again, a big thanks to Dan for coming on. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read every review and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters. We appreciate the support. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.